Hello. Nice to see you, every, everyone. Uh, thanks to Medium for uh, making this possible, that we can be here, everyone, sharing uh, stories of what we do, and uh, not at least about music. Uh, good of you to come, though the sun is shining. I can see uh, there's a lot of friends out there in the sun, maybe. And we just talked about, we just wanted to know what, what roles you had in, in your work with music. So just to know the discussion flow and the uh, you know, stories that will help you uh, and uh, maybe questions to us that will help us. Um, who is uh, working uh, in publishing? Labels? Management? Artists? Music supervision? Everyone. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Songwriters, yeah? Fantastic. Actors? We need some actors. We talked about that. <laughs> well, um, I have some notes here. Um, and first of all, um, today we're going to not talk about music that has been added to a product. We're talking about music that uh, you know, is the key to the universe that we're going to talk about, the process and the pr project that has been created around music and not music as an added thing. Because uh, we all, I think, can agree that music is really a keystone in our lives. We have uh, met, you know, the love of our life, maybe, with a song. We have broke up with the songs. Uh, we have a common language in music, everyone. So it's really important for us. So I, I'm really fond of us being able to talk today about something that is not music can sell anything but music, but it's actually music that actually is the foundation of, of, of the process. So, so that's really, really nice. Um, and uh, today's panel, we're going to talk about the musical genre in both television series and films. And the musical genre has been a success uh, ever since the beginning of uh, moving media. Um, in both the cinema and TV and Sound of Music from uh, uh, 59 to Top Hat with Fred Astaire, Grease, a high school musical, and to the beginning of creating musical uh, TV series in TV with Glee. Um, and it's not just a, a genre that is made by a struggling music business to try to survive. It's actually a genre that has been um, with us from all times because we like to, to see songs and uh, singers, uh, you know, blossom in in uh, in a storyline. Um, so, to share knowledge about the different aspects of working with that, we have a fantastic panel today, and uh, we have. Should, should we just go around uh, introducing? We have our names up here: Amelia, Kim, and Anastasia. Give them a, a round of applause. So, um, Amelia, hello. can you... Testing. Two. Testing, one, two. You're on. Um, yeah, hello, I'm Amelia. Um, I'm the head of music at Edible Shine. We're a TV production company, and I work on lots of projects, um, things like Black Mirror and Peaky Blinders. But um, for this specifically, we have got quite a few music ideas in development, and we've also made lots of other music-based programmes, um, all of which are to get to certain, you know, places, whether it's to launch a band or to use backhouse, but we'll probably discuss that a bit more later, but anyway. Um, hi. Is that... Hello? Yeah, I'm Kim Fuller. I'm a writer. Um, mainly comedy, actually. I'm not funny at the moment, but if you pay me, I'm hilarious. And, um, no, and I wrote the Spice Girls movie, and I've read other... Um, a, a series called S Club 7, which was about a band uh, for TV. We did a lot of episodes of that. Um, I write um, all kinds of genres, but but I do seem to get towards music-based um, comedy and entertainment because I find it interesting to put a script to a, a, a series and, and play around with whether the idea is real, you know, whether the situation is real or whether it's not real. As a writer, it's quite entertaining and interesting to do that. So, um, And I'm working on a couple of music-based projects at the moment as well, which I can tell you about. Hello, Anastasia Brown. I'm so happy to be here. I've never been to Medem, and it is really well organized. I um, hope to meet you all after. Uh, I have had a very diverse career, and uh, music is the common thread throughout 
26 years of, of hard work, starting with um, management, A&R, and then moving to production and music supervision. So as a supervisor, I think my most musical film was August Rush with um, Robin Williams and Carrie Russell. And, and, um, and then I actually um, produced and developed the movie about Hank Williams Sr., not Junior, with Tom Hiddleston. And I optioned those books 2003, and it came out 2016. So patience is a virtue if you want to produce a project. <laughs> Back to you. It is, yeah. Well, let's start just by um, opening up some 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 workflows and uh, in our daily lives. So, Kim, can you tell us about when you work with a script that is music based? Well, I think the thing about the question: Are there too many musical TV series? Um, I'm including movies in that as well, because particularly recently there've been biopics, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, and there's one about Elton John, and there seems to be a phase through the years of these projects suddenly appearing in, in clusters, and then for some years there wouldn't be very much. I mean, for me, um, music, the music industry and song, songs and bands have a kind of narrative built into them already, because you, 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 you're talking about, are they going to be successful? Are they going to be famous? Are they going to be people who are going to listen to the music? And so, as a writer, you have a structure that's already there, which isn't the case for other types of story. Um, I mean, mountaineering is pretty dramatic, but, you know, it's not, you, you know, are you going to be the best mountaineer in the world? I don't know, but I don't, you don't see those movies very much, you know? But um, music... Um, has drama, it has uh, aspiration, it has talent, it has people being um, kind of sincere about what they're offering to the world. I mean, I, I, I'm not a music musician, I'm mu musical in a way. Um, and it's a bit like as a writer, you're offering yourself, as a comedy writer, you're offering yourself up for people to go, that's not very funny, um, or that is funny. As a musician, you're offering yourself up as, yeah, we like that, or no, we don't like that, or that wasn't as good as the last song you did, or the last album. So it's, it's not surprising that there's such a lot of uh, um, content around music and around uh, stories based in music, as well as factual stories that are about artists who've passed away. Um, so it, it, from my point of view, working with people that were real, I mean, the Spice Girls, they were real in a way, um, but uh, you had to then interpret the reality that you see. You know, do you, you know, what are you trying to say about them? And, and I think with music-based content, I mean, you know better than me, you know, choosing the projects, you know, you've got to think about how do they want to be perceived? Is there part of their story that they don't want to share? Or if they've passed away, you know, that their family or their estate doesn't want to be seen. You have to juggle with that when they're still around. Like the Spice Girls were easy because they, they just said, yeah, whatever you want to do, you know, and so you can make them ridiculous and they didn't, it was part of the show, you know. But um, I think that in terms of um, what, how you choose the subjects for creating this content, um, as a writer it's difficult because you don't get a band necessarily coming to you and saying, hey, can you write a story for us? Um, and as a writer, you know, I might have ideas for artists, but, you know, management, as, as uh, you know, me will tell you, you know, you don't um, have writers knocking on the door and saying, hey, I've got a great idea for a series for one of your acts, because they might not be thinking like that at all. So it's, it's, it's an interesting area, but there's no... It, 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 the reason that some things work in clusters, I think, is because one is a hit, so everyone goes, hey, we'll do that too. And then it goes away, and then a couple don't work, and then it doesn't come back. Does that make sense? Or should I say it again? No, I thought that was perfect. Thank you. It was perfect. I was wondering, now that you had such a great success with the, the Spice Girl movie, have you been trying to, to find a similar project uh, and have you stumbled over something that was as crazy as that ever since? Well, not that was a good project because I was allowed to put all my ideas in there. I wasn't told no because they, they were um, very up for any idea. But I've, I've got a project I'm doing at the moment which is a, a, a bio, biography about a band that never made it. They were called the, the Hollywood Brats and they were in the 1970s. And it's a really funny and hilarious 
book about their lives, um, but it hasn't, in terms of a writer, there's no act three where they all made it successful. So it's interesting because they disappeared and then, and, then, and I think it's quite interesting because not every band makes it and I'm looking forward to doing it because it's noble, there's a lot of heart in there, they aspire, they try, they lived, you know, in horrible circumstances and did, you know, gigs in, in ter terrible places and even after all that they didn't make it but I think that's quite heroic actually. I think it's a heroic story of somebody that tried and never made it. So we you have, we'll do you have the name of the, of the project for us. It's so we well, can the book is called "Sick on You." Sick on you. Because it was a that. guy who wrote the song about his girlfriend, and he said, "I I don't want to see you anymore. I'm going to be sick on you." It's not very <laughs> nice, but uh, anyway, it's a funny uh, bio. We'll see. I might try and sell it to you. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So. Fantastic, Amelia. You oversee so many projects. Right. Uh, and uh, and what what I was thinking when I, you know, Googled you and uh, haunted you on the internet to to find out more about each of you, um, I was thinking about you know when when you meet a project that is is, is music driven, you also meet a lot of uh, craziness around it. P people that you know, if, if you're working on a film or a television series, there's so many things that you can in the end just change because you're not happy with it but if if you just love this song you can never do without it so as a supervisor we have to go through hell every time uh, a director or a producer wants a song but it's not reachable or stuff like that so so music when it's you know synchronized in in the heart of of the 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 viewer the the director whatever it's really difficult to get get you know another take on that so when you meet those people and it, the, the, the thing is really built on music, how do you work with that compared to, to normal, like Peaky Blinders you've been working on? I, I, I know no, no, nothing is normal, but um, uh, you know, I don't there know. There, there's sort of the, the, if we're looking at things from a music TV series point of view, the stuff that we've made um, in the past has been um, a bit like the stuff that Kim has done. So we've taken bands that have just been signed to labels and we've created um, um, a, uh, a comedy drama for them. So we've done lots of them. We did a girl band called Cleopatra, a girl band called Frank, a, girl, a boy band called North and South. And it was all based on the sort of monkeys model. So you take the band, they're sort of part... Uh, put together a part, not, and then you put them in this drama and then everybody falls in love with them and then the music then is given a new life because everybody then wants to buy. The thing about these sort of areas is whether you're doing Amy, which is like a straight biopic, or you're doing the real life drama of Elton John or Queen, or whether you're going to do, uh, create new copyrights, um, so whether it's pre-existing copyrights or you're creating new copyrights, you're creating the band, you're doing everything. The thing to remember is if you can get it right, um, whether it's a Mamma Mia model where it's a fantasy story written around about Castanog, blah, blah, blah. If you can actually get it right, it is like the, the perfect 360 model because everything just generates out of it. You can sell soundtracks. There's the copyrights that have existing lives of their own if they're pre-existing. It drives them to further things. It's kind of like, the, you know, the musical, if it, you could then take a musical out of a, a film and put it back in. So there's, if you can get it right, it's amazing. But coming from my point of view, from a TV production company, and I'm sure Kim and yeah, we all agree on this, is that actually the creative is the most important part. And actually, the story's got to be good, and it's got to have a, a really strong creative editorial reason for doing it, because otherwise everyone's just going to see straight through it, because it's going to be rubbish. Um, and so I would say that if you've got any ideas in this area, that you would need to really, really work on the development period and um, the thing, you know, the, the script writing, getting a script together, getting a, uh, you know, just a treatment together to try and see what you were going to do. But as I said, if you get it right, it's absolutely brilliant. If we see like five or ten years ago, uh, people that, uh, you know, uh, holded catalogs was maybe more protective than now. Has it changed? Are there, you know, maybe ten years ago, if you said, I want to do a, a film about the Beatles, we need all the songs, it would have been impossible. Is, has that changed? No. Um, I, I think that the, if you look at the Queen and uh, Mamma Mia and all those things, they've all been really driven by the artists who owns the copyrights. And then they've made sure that they've attached themselves to big players in the market who can then put the creative together for them and then drive it forward. Um, so I, I think if you're looking at doing more of those biopics, we've got a couple of things we've been looking at. It's actually a lot of the really big bands. The real problem is who drives the narrative. Because if you've got a band, say, for example, you have Led Zeppelin, 
Um, one of them's dead, but he's got a son. The other three are alive, but they've all got different management. And it's who who takes that narrative. So if you wanted to say, do something with the Sex Pistols, they would all want to drive that narrative forward. And the same with Pink Floyd. They all have a different take on what happened in the band. So that, that means actually trying to do stuff with them is really difficult. Oh, definitely. Right. When I was doing the Hank Williams senior uh, biopic, his family was very involved with the, um, with the narrative. And Hank did some really bad things, and he drank too much. And so we really had to, to be authentic. We, we had to just tell the family we're going to be authentic and um, walk them through it. But when I did the Billy Graham biopic, the producers, the lead producer didn't involve the family. And so when, they, when the, the movie came out, um, the children of Billy Graham sent a note to all the churches, don't don't watch the movie. So it's like a double-edged sword to get involved and they might want you to take out the bad stuff or don't get the family involved and then they spread a lot of negativity about the project. So it's 50-50. Yeah, I mean, exactly with the Queen film, for example, I felt that was a complete whitewash. But the fact that it's done so well just, I think, is sort of a testament to the strength of their songs and their songwriting. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. as a writer, you know, biopics is, is a different... I've not actually written um, anything quite like that. But um, they don't work often in a structured drama way. So you might need something really big to happen to turn the story around. And not, it's not often that a life fits perfectly into a movie. So you have to be selective. And I think that in being selective, sometimes you take out something that was it was that did really happen, but it wouldn't work in the movie because it would you know, throw the thing off into another direction. I mean Bohemian Rhapsody should be tragic really, but they ended it on that live aid gig mm. when I was there in fact on the live aid gig and it was a triumph. But actually it got really sad after that. So it's almost like people watch that and they go, oh yeah, Freddie Mercury was brilliant and it was great that he ended like that. And they go, no, no, there was a whole other stuff yeah. that didn't go in the movie. So. You see, if you're thinking that if the, if the Greatest Showman and the Queen movie are both a testament to how strong, strong those songs were and how weak the storylines were, that means that your writing on Spice Girls must have been epically brilliant. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that, actually. It has somehow stood some cult status, of not, which I'm not sure if it's postmodern ironic or what, but it's still being... I think the, people, the reason it works now is that the fans then, like 20 years later, they're all in quite positions of power in the media. They're 28 to 35, whatever years old, and that was their favourite movie. So I get a little bit of the backlash of, oh, yeah, we love that movie. You know? Whereas my contemporaries were like, you're doing what? For what? Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Well, anyway, that's... What, but um, but it, it, I think the thing is, in that sense, if you're allowed licence to do something and it's, and the, and the, it's work in progress because they, they were famous at the time and it was a slice of their lives, I didn't have to deal with the disintegration and all the rest of it. That's another movie, probably, but I won't write that one. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, so it's, it's like fitting, the, it's fitting life into, into the perspective of perception of someone you know doing a, a drama that's entertaining isn't it that's the issue Anastasia you have so many roles it sounds like uh, for me a, a, a dream uh, workflow work life you have because if, if the music supervision is, is not you know a big as a role as, as you can maybe manage to, to, to fulfill your whole work life with in Nashville. You have so many other uh, roles. And you, you mentioned something about, you know, actors playing musicians in, in, in TV series or uh, musicians acting uh, and your role in, in, you know, supervision that and also su supervision the, the, the songwriting and yeah. stuff. Can you share some, some light on stuff like so that? So when um, there are really... Um, musicals involved and we want an actor to sing or a, a singer to try to act, we actually get in, involved with casting, which is not normal. When I supervise a film that's not a musical, I don't get involved with casting unless someone needs to pick up a guitar um, or play a harmonica, whatnot. Then we get involved with the actors and teach them, get them teachers for, like for instance, Freddie Highmore and August Rush 
I had to get him an organ teacher, a piano teacher, and then in six months I had to try to convince him to play the guitar <laughs> and and bang on it and, and impress everyone like he's a prodigy. Um, and I and I found luckily Freddie was um, had very skinny long fingers and. Um, his m momager didn't allow a hand double, and I had I have worked with Keith Urban Sting and Peter Frampton. They're all prodigies, and I said, six months guitar lessons is not going to convince the audience that he is a prodigy, but I have our hand double, and the momager said no hand double. He's worked too hard. I'm like. The whole movie's going to fall apart. <laughs> and so I kept Cocky King is her name. I kept her in my back pocket. I knew. The, the, some, someone was going to say, we need some really impressive moves on the guitar here. <laughs> and um, so the only negative note Warner Brothers had on August Rush was he didn't look like a prodigy. And I had to bite my tongue. I didn't say, told you so. <laughs> I just called Cocky King and, and uh, flew her to wherever we needed. And, and so if you watch August Rush again, you'll see Freddie in the park wailing on the guitar, and that's actually Cocky King. And, um, and it really it made the whole movie believable. So I do encourage, uh, I, I do encourage artists who have a little bit of a knack of acting skills to do polish those skills because that's needed. Um, you know, for, thankfully, Jonathan Rhys Myers was actually able to sing. He had a great voice, but we used Luke Reynolds to be his ghost voice, and so actors can act, and they can, f like, talk like you, like, at the drop of a dime. So in the studio, we'll have ghost singers that they, c they kind of copy, and that's how um, it becomes believable, really. And same with Rodney Crowell was uh, Tom Hiddleston's guide for six months. He lived with Rodney Crowell, and I don't know if you know Rodney, but he's um, on the level of Bob Dylan, and in my opinion. Um, and so, so if you're able to do both, sing, play, and act, there is uh, money to be made for you because that's very rare, and we do need that skill. I see a lot of notebook. Books, you know, you're taking notes. Uh, normally, we hear some advice about, you know, how, how to to approach uh, supervision uh, uh, companies and stuff like that. But I've never heard that advice before. I think it's it's a brilliant advice if you have those skills. Yeah. Um, the topic today was also about too many uh, television musicals genres made in and in development. Can there be too many? No. Never. Never. <laughs> I need more. <laughs> but can we can we keep up the good quality then if if yeah. we have too many? Yeah, there's probably too many in development that are rubbish. Yeah, and not enough. Uh, but it will be the you know. I mean, for example, if you're talking about the we've just made a Black Mirror that's got Miley Cyrus in it playing a pop star. Um, I've only just got around to actually relaxing about even being able to say that out loud. It's been such a massive secret, other than the fact she mentioned on that radio show months ago, and then we had to pretend it hadn't happened. But um, but the reason we managed to get her because she's brilliant is because she bought into the creative, and she loved the narrative of the show. So it's all about the you know the product. And I, we were sort of saying earlier that actually if you've got something you want to develop that the the TV series now is we're saying that everything's going where the money is so the money is now in Netflix and it's in Amazon and it's in long form and but if you're expecting Netflix to hand over 10 million pounds for an eight part musical drama you really do need to know how to make one and I know television looks like it's really easy but it's really not um, from I mean like you know when we make something like I mean like the Black Mirrors and Peaky Blinders the production uh, term is a year so we'll shoot for you know six seven months and then we'll be in post uh for i mean months and months on the on, you know and it's really technical and really um i mean the deliverables for someone like netflix are just off the scale in terms of the technicality involved in and the in, you know the mixes and 5.1 deliveries and all the kind of stuff that goes with it so uh, my advice would be if you've got a really good idea and you think it's got legs is to try and find either a writer <laughs> Uh, a or producer. A, or a producer. I am for hire, yeah. actually, by yeah. the way. Writer or a producer or a production company who've got a track record of making this kind of thing because the, you will need that sort of attachment for it to go to have any legs at all, really. I think, from, a, from my point of view, listening to, to, to the two very highly skilled and experienced execs here doing what they do, um, it, it's... Um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer coming out with ideas, 
for me to kind of come up with something for a, a major star, even if, even with what I've done, I mean, it, I'd probably get the meeting, but um, you know, you're then into the whole thing of how they want to be perceived, how they want, you know, what they want to be seen as being. They want, like you're saying, you know, they don't want certain parts of their lives, um, you know, exaggerated too much. So, and given that I do comedy, you need to have a freedom to um, express what you want. So it's easier for me to make it up than if you than if you make it up and you've got a fictitious uh, singer or songwriter or artist. What's the story? And 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 you can make one up and then they say, well, that's a bit like Sansa's story, but it's not them. But you have the freedom to be able to say, well, it's a bit like Prince, but it's not Prince because otherwise you'd be, you know, you wouldn't be able to do it. On the other hand, because it's not Prince, then people why not the brand isn't there to to help the audience go and see it so i find it quite interesting um that uh, in, in movies you know you've got um la la land you've got those uh you know star is born and they're fictitious stories so you don't have that problem and you really just deal with the story as as you want and make it as dramatic and as interesting as you can um without having somebody leaning over your shoulder and going hey i didn't say that i, didn't, I don't want that in you know because that's as a writer, that's like, well, hang on, man, it's it's not funny enough. We'll write you a funnier line. <laughs> They're like, no. And so it's it's the difference between the working between real life and and life that you create. And just as a very quickie, when I was doing S Club Seven as a series, we did a lot of we did fifty something episodes, and they um, and and when we started, the idea was they were a band. They hadn't released a single or anything, so we started the TV show, and they were a band. And they, the story was they'd been sold to their um, manager, and he'd he'd said, "Oh, you're going to go to America," and they thought they were going to go to Vegas, and they went to um, they went to Miami in this little motel, wasn't it? That was the sort of dramatic S Club Miami. S Club Miami, and then because I needed to have meetings in LA, I've changed it, and they went to LA after that. But the point is, they were they were not successful in the show, but in real life, they were massively successful. So the audience was. They managed to deal with that fiction of them in the show and get involved in the drama, but in real life they go and see them on stage, and so they knew they weren't famous, but they were bought into the drama of the, and the comedy of the show. It was quite interesting. And when one of them left, the guy Paul left in the last series, and I knew we knew he was leaving, so I wrote the episode where he left in the show, and in the show it was really emotional and they were all crying. And they all said, as as performers, they said when he really left, they didn't really they didn't really care. It was like, oh, he's left. But you know, in the in the show, they were crying, and it was because we'd created the drama. He rode up on a motorbike, and it was like a horse, and he reared it up on the back wheel, and all that stuff. So it's funny how you then the drama is actually more real than the reality. So I I like the playing around with what's real and what isn't real. That's. Lest we forget that series, I mean, the round that was so successful, it actually spawned a whole new band, S Club Juniors. Juniors, yes. Well, they, they weren't quite as good. So it's like, how much toothpaste can you squeeze out of the tube? Yeah, exactly, you know? just to see how much longevity this has got. Actually, it's a new band. Yeah. Anyway, but you, you know what I mean? I mean, you're, you're working with reality and fiction. It's it's Because even a biopic's not true, is it? In a way, you could kind of go, well, it's a selection of things. I mean, it just comes back to the fact that the, it's all about the writing. It's yeah. all about the writing. It's, you know, and actually, if you, or you, when you're looking at the ones that are um, like La La Land, for example, La La Land worked, but actually, it, when you, the higher concept you go, the more sort of the more likely they are to fail, really, because you, so that sort of famous TV thing about you jumping the shark. But, mm. but if, if you if you like looking at a biopic, you have. You have the, the, the story of the songwriters and the, the artists, and you have the songs that we all know. So if you, do, if you build up a television musical genre series, you, you start out with having you know, one season full of fantastic songs because that was like the beginning of building up this television series. Can you, can you keep up the good work you know, in season three and four with, with the television flow and, uh, and pace that you work with? Because for, for me, you know... Songs are. It's it's more important for me to say, I better get out of this before it's get bad because I'm not in it, in it for the money. But I'm not a production company. I'm not a, you know, a, a Hollywood uh, whatever big industry uh, setup. So so I'm for for me the 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 quality of music also to secure you know 
the relationship uh, with audiences uh, f f in the future is important. So if if you look at like Benny and Bjorn from from ABBA, they are not songwriters; they are dragon hunters. They are attending the studio every morning just to be sure that if the dragon comes out, they can, you know, catch it. Uh, and and it takes time to write those good songs. So uh, is it good for the music to uh, to be in a, a television pace that needs every week a new song, a new bunch of songs that is not good enough? Well, I think that's the case with any long-standing television series, whether it's the music or the screenwriting or the acting. Um, it's like Grey's Anatomy is just such a odd bird because it's gone so long. Um, so I, I think that's why Glee ended. It, 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 ha it told its story and it was time to, you know, let it let it go. So you, you could kind of feel when the end is near. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with the, with the SL, because it was 60, well, it's 58 episodes, and there was probably a new song in most of them. Some weren't as good, frankly. I mean, they weren't, because you can't write a hit like that. I mean, at least you were dealing with an artist who's dead. He's not going to write anymore. So once you've done them all, then that's the end of it. Yeah. Whereas this, you know, there was like a machine system going. Like, there were a lot of songwriters. They'd be... You know, I don't know, 20 songwriters and they'd be all producing a certain number and then the management would choose them and put them in and some were hits and some weren't hits. So I guess, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, Benny and Bjorn, you know, you know they're digitizing them now. Did you know that they're, they're digitizing ABBA into a virtual holographic band as they were? Okay. And they're writing new songs. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they've written like two or three new ABBA songs that you've yeah. never heard. Yeah. I've heard a couple of them, and they're ABBA songs sung by ABBA, but you've never heard them before. No. And they're going to be avatars, you know, in a. See, this is you an heard that? This is an episode of Black Mirror. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. That, that. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, then at least you know if they're digital, they're not going to argue with each other and fall out with each other. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? They'll just they're carry on. Same forever. room together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. You imagine the avatar walks off and says, "I'm not going to work with them anymore." <laughs> I refuse to stay on the I same stage. Refuse to stay on the same <laughs> digital format as this person. I just wanted to, to let you know that if you have questions, just hit us. Uh, we can also take like. Don't literally hit us, please. <laughs> we can also take the last ten minutes for questions. But if you have something that springs to mind, please, please let us know now. You have a question. Yeah. You get a mic now because I think they're filming it, and uh, we need to hear you. Fantastic. Okay. So one of the things that I do is write for musical theater. And someone recently advised me that there's a much bigger market in film and TV for that kind of context. So I guess from a creative standpoint, is it a different approach? Well, what, you mean musical theater? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, Mamma Mia started as a play. Yes. And in London. And the girl who came up with that, the woman who came up with that was... Um, Obviously, didn't have access to to ABBA, but she created that format of the wedding and all the rest of it, and looking for the fathers. So, I'd say if that's where you know that can grow into something. I mean, if you've got yourself a stage production that is happening and you can bring people along and watch it and say I did that, then then that's much better than kind of going with an abstract idea or at least a treatment or a pitch, well, because you know. That depends on a lot of people saying, yeah, we want to make this. I don't know what you think, but it feels, do it. If you can do it in that form, for sure. What about for something that isn't pre-existing for the stage? I mean, from creating something new, musical, is it a different thought process than for creating for film and television than it would be creating for the theater? Not, not necessarily, I wouldn't think. A lot of these musicals are theatrical, really, especially the old Hollywood stuff, isn't it? They're, they're very much staged and very much... You know, um, their stories, people talking or moving around the furniture and singing. Uh, I, I think the story is the key. What is it about? And who's in it? And what's, what are you trying to say is the key, key thing for me. Yeah, and I suppose there's probably more character development. Yeah. In and the music would function the same way? To drive the dr the drama. Yeah, I mean, if if yeah, I mean, the thing with this with some music, it's illustrative of of something. Uh, if it's not written as part of a narrative, I mean, a, a musical is written, and this song will tell you that he's in love with her and she's rejected him. But 
and that's why it goes where it goes. But, you know, if you're writing songs that are great songs, you could still find a place for them. Um, I, I, I don't think that the, the song, I guess in the musical theatre, then the song should drive the narrative. Yeah, but that's the purpose. You know, exactly. So, uh, but I mean, it doesn't preclude you writing great songs and finding a space for them. I mean. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I suppose Moulin Rouge and Greatest Showman are examples of that, really, aren't they? That, you know, as I said, it's the weird, weird thing about it is they sort of, as if you can get it right, as it's like a 360, it doesn't matter if it comes from the musical or whether it comes from the TV show, whether it comes from a film, they will, or whether it's, you know, they sort of spawn each other and then they then just keep making revenue the whole time. So if you've got a good enough storyline and you've got great characters and you've got songs that are driving your narrative forward, then it should, that should be, it should break through. And I mean, right now, people are really watching podcasts and how many people are interested in those podcasts for creating content. That's a new trend I've noticed where there's these exploding podcasts and the networks are going to them and optioning the, that idea. So we, also, we haven't mentioned Hamilton, but I mean, I suppose that's exactly. a good thing to accept because there's bound to be a film in, you know, either yeah. in development or being made mm. of Hamilton or whether they turn it into a long form and if it gets commissioned by Netflix, for example. So, you know, it works sort of. I mean, it's a collaboration. You know, I can't write songs, but I can write a, a, a story in which songs would feature. So that's why you have, the, you know, Roger Zamberstein and you, you have these partnerships because they're two different skills in a way. Um, but combined, they work, you know, if you get the right collaborator. Anyone else has questions? Because then we have four minutes left and I would really love to hear your most uh, amazing memory you have working with music. It can be when you picked up a, a, a guitar when you were four or you heard somebody sing uh, for the first time or whatever. You buy a, a, a vinyl record or just the, the most important music moment for you guys. What was that about? Is oh, getting um, an Oscar nomination. Wow. <laughs> Tell us about that. Um, so Sorry to go back to August Rush, but there's so many stories within that movie. It took two and a half years before we even went into production to create all the music for Jonathan and everyone else. But um, I had to find a authentic choir in Harlem. And so I went looking for choirs in Har Harlem. <laughs> First time there, really. Um, and I found uh, a, a, this choir that literally were just barely getting by. And um, we added the, the young actress to that choir. But, um, and the fact that they were nominated and performed on the Oscars was a night that I'll never forget. And, and now everyone in that choir is working and making a really good living because of that movie. So um, watching that, that choir from very humble beginnings sing on the Oscar stage was definitely one of my highlights. Sounds amazing. Congratulations with that. Um, well, I've got two. One was when I managed to do the F chord on the guitar without my fingers really. <laughs> that is I, also a difficult task. When my fingertips got so hard they didn't hurt after I'd done it, that was that was a big one. But I guess, uh, I guess really, what, I mean, if you're looking at events, I mean, when I did the movie, the Spice movie, because it was so random and it so uh, came out. I, I mean, the story of how that happened was so kind of um, unlikely and I did it on spec and I I thought I was just writing this thing that no one's ever going to see and the band, are never, they're going to spit up before long and I, I didn't really understand what was going on and then it got a bit more of a momentum. And then when I watched it at the end, um, uh, when it went on the screen, was that was the moment really. Prince Charles and and Harry and William were were there too. And they were like 10 or something. And they were completely in love with all the girls, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, um, that was it, really. Sounds amazing. So that was, it was unexpected. I think the unexpected things are good. But I think that F chord is still pretty up there. Is it? It is, yeah. You actually you tried G sharp minor. I, I, I had three guitar lessons and gave up. Oh. Um, so I, that's not going to happen. I, my, and I definitely can't do first ever vinyl because I bought Buck's Fizz. It was the first ever single I bought. Tragic. Um, <laughs> but I can't, I can't really think of anything. Or things I've been really proud of. Um, oh, God. 
Well, I, yeah, I know not. Re- um, I was so I just I was working for a tour management company. We were touring Public Enemy, and they were headlining Reading, and I was side of stage for Nirvana when they did that. But actually, side of stage that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Cool, yeah. And this is going to sound really, really tragic, but I remember seeing Tina Turner uh, in about. 1998 at Wembley and I have to say she was fucking incredible <laughs> she was so her and her dancers they blew me off I, they blew my mind oh here, here's a funny a little funny story I did a movie for Quentin Tarantino and um, I had this idea because um, the lead character um, loved Hip hop and um, folk and country and cowboy. She liked all these different ca- uh, kinds of music. And her father, Johnny Knoxville, said, "Well, how do you like hip hop?" And then that I chose Marty Robbins and and Wu Tang Clan. Um, and she's like, "Well, they're telling stories about their lives, Dad. There, there's no difference except in their life stories." So I, I dreamt mashing up Marty Robbins, Utah Carroll, and Wu-Tang Clan, Better Tomorrow, and I merged those two songs for our end title. I got an email from Quentin saying, this is effing amazing. That was cool. And then, but then I had to clear it. And Wu-Tang Clan had <laughs> four different publishers. They only took my calls at midnight, and they all carried guns. <laughs> that was a hard clearance. Oh, I got told to move out of the way by Stevie Wonder once. <laughs> I was doing the Mandela Day in London, the Mandela uh, Wembley thing, and I was working on the comedy, Lenny Henry was doing the comedy, and he was late, and I was standing there, and they were saying, where's where's Steve Wonder? And Lenny Henry said, we've got to do more material. I said, I've got no more material, there's 100,000 people. You've done everything, you know, you've ordered all the, we did a whole thing where they ordered um, hamburgers, and they all put their hands up if they wanted cheese, you know, that's 20,000 with cheese. And I'm trying to make stuff up to keep them going. And I'm standing there, I said, where the hell is Steve Wonder anyway? And he was behind me, he said, I'm here, man, can you move out of the way? (laughs) Oh my God. I said, I'm really sorry, I'll remember this moment, I said. See, I've got a Stevie Wonder story. Shall I try and out Stevie Wonder you? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> we were, we'll just call you um, huh. whip topping. Right. Um, we, were, we were making the Brit Awards and he was presenting Outstanding Achievement to the Eurythmics and I was trying to clear a piece of music for him to walk onto and EMI just kept saying to me, he has to approve everything and I kept saying to them, he's downstairs and they were like, well, there's nothing we can do. So I just went downstairs and said to his, explained to him what, to his manager what was happening and he just said, I'll just come in and talk to Stevie. So I went in and said to him, well, hi, I'm Amelia and, blah, and he was like, lovely to meet you and blah. So I said to him what was happening, I was trying to, blah, and they couldn't get it approved and he said to me, well, you know, what, what piece of music were you thinking of using? And I said, well, super Superstition, but obviously you can walk down to anything you want to. Um, obviously, it's you know completely your choice. And he just uh, sort of paused for a bit and then just went. Well, I always thought that was quite a good tune. <laughs> I was like that. I'm just all right. That's it. I've died. That was the last word because uh, my best experience was this panel today. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, everyone, for coming, and thank, thank you guys. Great job. Thank. You.